So welcome to Conversations That Matter. Today we're with Sean Monson, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to talk, talk about your film, Earthlings, okay. and maybe some other stuff. Sure. So uh, first of all, um, I saw the film last week. Mm -hmm. It was uh, uh, by myself in a hotel room. <laughs> And, uh, Let me just interject for a second. Did you get through the whole thing in one sitting, or did you have to? Um, I did. It in steps? Well, no, I did. I got through. I, I did. I got through the the, the uh, whole thing in one setting. I played it straight through. Um, I think I did stop it to use the bathroom or something. Right. But uh, the strange thing was, yeah. I uh, I was watching. I was eating dinner while while doing this. <laughs> wow. But uh, subconsciously, I ordered a vegetarian meal. Oh. And, um, so you didn't feel too guilty. So it then. wasn't too right. guilty, and, and I guess I had no, I don't know. But mm -hmm. yes, I did sit through the whole thing, um, and uh, there was pauses while I was eating yeah. because I was in awe. Right. Uh, but I did get through my food, and then, uh, yeah, I, I moved around a lot. I had mm -hmm. my, it was on my laptop, so mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. moving around. But um, very intense film. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can I still see the images today and still feel the weight that the film carries. Right. And uh, well, first of all, what uh, to, what's the story? What's the story behind it? What inspired the film? Um, how yeah. did where did it start? Well, let's see. Um, uh, I became a. I was raised like most. I, I suppose I'm raised in America. I was raised like most American families uh, on a meat and dairy diet and. And I saw footage in the early 90s of um, pigs being slaughtered, and I was um, appalled, as most people are, I think, when they see slaughter of animals, which is interesting. We actually touch on this in, in the new film about being carnivores, and if we're really, if mankind, if humankind is really carnivorous or not, mm -hmm. because the carnivorous animal and humans are animals, of course, but the carnivorous animal um, sort of licks their chops when they see blood and suffering. It's like a shark in the water when they see, you know, the panic. They sort of, it's almost like a lust that, that is aroused in some way. And uh, the lion with the weak prey, you know. And yet, in contrast to that, the human usually is repelled by blood and right. bloodletting. We don't like to see it. <clears throat> right. And yet we boast that we're carnivorous, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, so the footage is usually kept hidden. It's hard to come by. You don't see it. Actually, you can go online now and see footage pretty easily. But um, in the 90s when I was, you know, the only people that were doing this sort of thing were animal welfare groups, mm -hmm. whether it was your the Humane Society, PETA, of course, which is known right. for being a little bit more radical. But there's lots of groups all over the world that were showing abuses to animals. and. Um, and so I remember uh, seeing footage and being so moved by it that I, I didn't want to contribute to it anymore. I wanted to become a vegetarian, and I did. And then I thought, well, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if there was a sort of tool that existed? And I began looking for any film that existed out there. And there were some films out there that had been around. But most of the groups would have um, a video that dealt with a particular issue. Let's say it was fur or circuses or whatever the, whatever the cause may be. And there was none that I knew of that sort of had the whole thing Right. In, in one, right. you know, the whole thing in one, in one dose. And so as I, as I did my research, I thought, well, there's pretty much five areas. You know, there's, these are the five areas that humankind uses animals for economic purposes. Mm -hmm. And it was the pet industry, food, of course, um, clothing, mm -hmm. entertainment, and scientific research. Right. So these were the five categories I, I just put it all into. And then I was a bit overwhelmed. I thought, well, who am I to sort of do something like this? I, I don't... I don't know anything, but I, it just it nagged at me so much that I had to assemble something. So I began, I began gathering footage. I, I started in, because the pet section is the first section of the film, I began going out on what's called a ride-along with mm -hmm. animal control officers. I started in South Central LA and in Long Beach, and I began to just kind of go right along. And, and one of the big switches, this was early on, I didn't really have the whole thing mapped out yet, but they pick up all these dead animals and they euthanize, we euthanize a lot of animals in this country. I'm not sure what the statistic is today, but I think it's about 30,000 dogs and cats per day just wow. in America, which if you were to pile, a, a, if you were to make a pile of 30,000 animal corpses, it's about three stories 
high. And this is a daily occurrence wow. in, in just in America. And again, that number might be higher or lower right now, but that's what I heard. And so what happens is when they're euthanizing, they put them in this refrigerated room, mm -hmm. a room about this size. And um, when I looked in the room and saw all these, and these are domestic animals, these are mostly dogs and cats, some roadkill you'd see in there, it might right. be a rabbit or a, or a coyote or a possum, but mostly dogs and cats that have been euthanized. And it was something about seeing the domestic animal in a, in a refrigerated room, and that was the switch. It was like a fridge, and it made me think of meat. Mm -hmm. So I went from dogs and cats to cows and pigs and chickens right away, even though there were no cows or pigs or chickens in that room, but the, right. it, was about, it was about the fridge that did it. Right. And that's when I realized it had to be covering more just, than just yeah. And so it went from pets to right. food, and it just began to spread from there. Yeah, I guess that was my next question. Was there a specific event that triggered? Oh, well, I guess what triggered the first, just the first act of going out and filming the uh, the the the. The, with the animal control with officer. The animal control well, officers. no, I'd read that statistic that I just mentioned, okay. and I was puzzled by that because everybody usually loves our dogs and cats, and I just thought, well, what if it was? A, what if it started as a PSA, mm -hmm. you know, a public service announcement right. about spaying and neutering your pet? Just right. please, you know, spay and neuter. And uh, so that's why I went out with the we call them ACOs, animal mm -hmm. control officers. I went out with the ACO, and um, and then it was of course seeing that refrigerated room that. That was the leap from pets to food, and then there was another leap from food to clothing, right. another leap from clothing to entertainment, which is like circuses, right. there's rodeos, bullfighting, I mean worldwide, not just here. Yeah. And then of course, um, animal research, which is one of the toughest subjects because the animals are often kept alive. Yeah. Even in slaughter, in food, they're at least slaughtered. Yeah, some, those were some of the most disturbing yeah. images. We've yeah, just it's, seen. it's extraordinary. And some of it's old, but it was so, it's so hard to get this footage. Yeah. Even to this day, it's incredibly hard. I mean, that's quite interesting to me. It's like Fort Knox, some wow. of these places. They're doing tests on rats or whatever, right. beagles. Why is that? That's interesting. Um, in fact, in 2005, they enacted a law called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And those first two words are quite are key, animal enterprise, any sort of animal enterprise that profits from mm -hmm. the use of animals in whatever one of these areas, mostly food, but um, if a former employee or a journalist or a filmmaker or someone was to get inside and document the goings on mm -hmm. in there, and if that footage was to be released and if the company, the enterprise, could show a loss of profit and that's the wording in the actual bill, loss of profit, then the filmmaker, the whistleblower, the journalist can be imprisoned. And that was really? passed about seven years ago. Yeah. And they call it a terrorism act, so it's, an act of, it's considered an act of terrorism. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's that's... extraordinary, it's extraordinary. And it was, I think it was the Gazette or it was a newspaper that said it's a, it's a curious terrorist organization that's never killed anybody yeah. before. And post 9-11, you know, that term, you know, within five years of that, event, you know, it, it, as today still, it still reverberates. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. So. And, and, it's, <clears throat> and it's, if anything, it's out there to save lives then well, too. Yeah. I mean, the, ultimately, the, the, the you know, for, but it's, right. this is, it's just it's insane every yeah. day. I, it's, and even today, I, I mean, I, I forget the latest, we'd have to look them up, but there's bills being passed in each state right now. I think maybe it's passed in three states, I'm not sure, three. Um, where it is it's against the law to film inside. Wow. Um, well, yeah. by, with that said, during the making of the film, uh, probably more so after, but during did you run into, resistance. did you make enemies and huh. resistance? Uh, or, yeah. And then on the reverse, did you have yeah. people trying to help you out? Well, yeah. people certainly helped. I have to thank most of those animal groups, and there's a number of them, worthy groups. Mm -hmm. One thing I discovered is that um, you know, you could have a Chihuahua rescue organization in some town, and then you could have the Humane Society or IFA, which is the Inter International Fund for Animal Welfare. You could have these, you know, big groups, well-funded groups and smaller groups. There's a group here in LA called LCA, Last Chance for Animals, and I, I found that um, different groups sometimes specialize, it seemed, on, 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 in certain issues. So I, as I recall, LCA happened to have, a, you know, a tremendous amount of circus footage. Mm -hmm. So, so if I wanted a certain, you know, in these five areas of the movie, if I needed something more, I would go to certain, you know, groups. If I wanted ocean stuff, of course, I would go to Greenpeace or Sea Shepherd. Mm -hmm. um, 
to name a few. And there's just these worthy groups out there that have documented. Mercy for Animals is a tremendous organization. They've got some. How they, much of the they footage penetrate would you say footage. was in the film was actually from some of these groups? Or Most from, of it. I would oh, say okay. I shot very little because right. the more I tried to shoot, the more difficult it became. And I realized, same thing I did on Unity, the new film, is that mm -hmm. um, this is an important point, I think. You know, I tabled any um, artistic desire, you know, cinemagraphically mm -hmm. in terms of like, I want to shoot this. I want to frame it. Mm -hmm. I want to author this shot. I, I sort of set that aside. Right. And, I, and because it's so difficult to penetrate, that you almost need, if you're in another country, you almost like if you're in Spain trying to get bullfighting, how am I supposed to go to Barcelona right. and waltz in and get this amazing footage? Right. Whereas if I get some local right. a activists in, you know, in Madrid or in Barcelona, then they can get, you know. So I began just, the challenge of Earthlings was really the composition. I At see. that point was the, the composition of how you're going to present it. But I, I let go of any you know, artistic notion that I need to shoot it. I just mm -hmm. didn't care anymore. Um, yeah, it was too difficult to do that. Right. So. Yeah, I, I mean, and some of the stuff like with the, uh, with the dolphins and, and yeah. the slaughter there, yeah. how did but that just came into your position? Or Sometimes, let's see, that was, so that's before The Cove or some of these films that have come out more recently right. that preceded it. Earthlings was finished in 2005. Um, sometimes when I began really asking around, first it was hard, it's like, who is this guy? He's asking right. for footage, what does he want? I got Joaquin Phoenix to narrate it, yeah. as you know, and Joaquin had um, been on the rise. I met Joaquin in 2000 mm -hmm. or 2001. He had just done, been nominated for his performance in a movie called Gladiator. Mm -hmm. He'd done Gladiator and uh, he got nominated and suddenly he was just th quite insulated. Yeah. Well, he, was, he, was, he was thrust upon him and he was, and he agreed to do it. He's been a vegan his whole life and, oh, wow. and I just thought he'd be great for it. I saw him in that movie mm -hmm. and he was so intense and I, I thought, and I had no connection to Joaquin Phoenix. I had never met, I didn't know anybody who knew him. No, right. I thought he'd be good. And, uh, he, and he wasn't available, but I, I persisted. And about six months later, you know, his publicist, it was ultimately his publicist, Sue Patricola, bless her heart, who said, fine, send over something, send over. And I had assembled maybe 10 minutes of something. Right. And I got a call three days later that Joaquin wants to meet. So I met with him and we talked for three hours. He agreed to do it. And, um, but once he was attached, is what I'm leading up to, then it became a little easier. There was sort of a legitimacy. I see. Once he was attached, there was a legitimacy that, oh, this might be like a real little film. And then, and then in answer to your question about where the footage came from, sometimes I set up a P.O. box. Sometimes it's like a brown paper bag. Wow. The tape would come in from somewhere. And, um, and, and after a while, you know, this is sort of scarring, as you can imagine, some mm -hmm. of this stuff. I would get a tape. I remember I got a tape once. And... It was unmarked, this tape, and it was, um, I think it was a mini DV tape. Mm -hmm. That was the format. And I popped it in, and there's a scene in the movie where they throw a dog into the back yes. of the trash. Yeah, that was one of the hardest truck. scenes to watch. I... Yeah, they just throw, I call it, the scene was his life unworthy of life. Yeah. You know, you just throw this, literally throwing it away. I was punching things, and yeah. I was watching that, I was just yeah. shaking my head. It's screaming. very poor, it's very grainy, yeah. it's in Turkey. I think it's in the country of Turkey. And... Um, I just, you know, wept. Yeah. I just sat there like weeping. I had a studio in my garage I'd built that I was cutting in. Yeah. And then, um, so I would get afraid every time a tape would come because I had no idea. What it would be, yeah. But I had to look at it. I, I always felt like I, I couldn't not look. There's a quote, I, I forget who said it. Um, I think it was a woman named Gretchen Weiler who worked for the Humane Society and she said, we must not refuse with our eyes what they must endure with their bodies. Yeah, I and I thought, that. I can look at a video in the comfort of my home and take a moment. But you'll, you know, as you know, people are resistant to see this kind of thing. You know, there's a, well, a hesitation you, to it. You got Moby to, to do, do the soundtrack, yeah. which is, uh, you know, a lot of those tracks I recognized sure. from, from his past works, but you chose some, some of my favorite tracks right. from Moby. I, I, I'm a big Moby fan. Yeah, um, me too. And so how did that, can you tell us about that process? Well, I had originally, I had a classical soundtrack because I thought it would be, I thought the imagery was so heavy, it, 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 and it is. I thought mm -hmm. you should tone it down and give this sort of gentle music. And I was naively thinking that classical music was less expensive than other music, and it turns out 
you know, for anybody who's trying to score a movie, that classical music is not less expensive. <laughs> right, right. Even though they're not selling millions of units of classical CDs, but for some reason it was too expensive. And uh, I had a friend named Libra, Libra Max, who knew Moby. And she'd seen my cut, this classical music cut, and I said, I can't use any of this music. Like, I can use maybe two tracks. Right. And I, I said, I can't believe it. Because music is, you know, it's, it, it's like surgical to go into a film and like to pull that out. Yeah. It's like just pulling all the plumbing out of your building. It's just, yeah. it's not easy. And she goes, what do you think about Moby? And I thought, too, too techno, too electric, it'll be too harsh. Right. She says, no, you should think about it. She became our music supervisor on the film, actually. Oh, and, nice. and, and sure enough, yeah, he said, I'd be happy to do it. And, and he said, just go to my catalog, right. take anything you like. Awesome. So, um, so I did. I went through every Moby yeah. CD, every B-side, every import, <laughs> every bootleg I could find. And right. I, I emailed him back and I said, what about all this? He's like, man, man, knock yourself out. So, awesome. Good choices. And that's yeah, how that came to be. So what, after the movie, what were some of the um, things and, and, you know, you're showing the movie, you're going around, what's, mm -hmm. what's the reactions? What, what kind of repercussions? Yeah. Well, no, no pushback in terms of animal welfare groups because I never really, um, I mean, in terms of animal enterprises, excuse me, because I never really said, you know, don't eat at, you know, this restaurant or don't do that. I just talked about the meat industry or the dairy industry or whatever. But I realized I had a problem with the film whenever um, I submitted it to 25 film festivals and only three accepted it. Mm -hmm. And this included documentary film festivals. A lot of documentary, there's like just documentary festivals out there. And those were always the most painful. I thought, I'm like, wait a minute, right? I don't think this is a bad film. Mm -hmm. It's a small budget film, but I mean, why isn't this getting accepted? You've got an Academy Award nominated actor, because mm -hmm. people in Hollywood respond to that sort of thing. You have a cool you know, soundtrack. Right. And you have a good cause, you know, like, wh why isn't this? Be and no, and they were afraid to show it. One woman from, I think, a, a festival in New Orleans, she emailed me and she said, I'm sorry, I just, we're afraid to show it. You know, we have a lot of vendors here and right. that are all sell animals, or use animals, we're just... So um, we had a screening at, uh, at CAA, the agency here in Los Angeles, we had a screening. Um, Woody Harrelson, who was a supporter of the film, and his brother Brett, who was one of our producers, had, had tried to get some interest in there. Joaquin came. Dennis Hopper was there. I remember sitting next to him for that screening. And, wow. and we had distributors that had come. Oh, and now five years had passed since I had started it, to the time I finished it. Okay. And Joaquin had a new film that had just come out called Walk the Line, which was this Johnny Cash biopic. Yeah. And suddenly he was nominated again. And so in okay. this, it was funny how this trajectory worked out. So he was, again, sort of this hot thing, you know, because that new movie had just come mm -hmm. out. But the distributors came, it was HBO, it was Lionsgate, it was a number of others, and they just said, you, you cannot release this film. You wow. cannot release it. There's no audience for this film. And uh, we weren't even trying to sell it to make any money. We really didn't right. care. I'd financed it my, myself. Um, I didn't spend a lot, but I'd, I'd spent more than I had right. to, to, to make it. And um, they said, you, you've got to sweep it under the rug or cut it drastically. And I remember having a conversation, I think it was with HBO, I went to New York, I met with a, a director of documentary programming in New York, and um, she'd said to me, well, can you, cut, can you cut around this a little bit? And I said, well, how do you cut around it? Like, let's take the pigs, you know, the pork section, for instance, how do you cut around it? We have ear clipping, we have teeth cutting, we have tail docking, we have castration. I mean, there's a lot of things that are shown, as yeah. you know. Like, how, how does one cut around it? And then I said, this is the documentary film. Mm -hmm. This is the non-fiction right. film. You know, how much truth do you want me to cut out of this movie? And why? Why do you want me to cut out? Right. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it. So, um, so it broke me. It, uh, wow. Yeah, it, it literally, that film bankrupted me. And um, I remember two years passed. Or maybe I'm shooting ahead, but just to no, wrap it yeah. up. Um, two years passed in the film, just no, one, no mm -hmm. one responded to it. And then it began to pop up on the Internet just for whatever reason, people oh, okay. began, I think animal advocates right. probably were saying, trying to show it to their family or friends, right. literally as small as that. And um, we began noticing it in different languages, which we hadn't translated. Right. Multiple languages, multiple languages. We couldn't keep up on the DVD. We, I think we have 10 languages on the DVD right now and subtitles, but there were 40 online that we were aware of. And we found the film streaming in over 200 websites that we knew of. It had over a million hits on Google, another million views on YouTube. Right. And it began to sort of, same cut, same film right. from before, not a single change, not, a, not promoted any different. Right. No push. 
maybe it was just a little ahead of its time, something began, and today it's still, to this day, we still sell it. Uh, it's for free on our website, but people want to own a copy, they right. still buy it. And where do they Strong. go to buy that, just so we can let everybody uh, know? <laughs> well, they can go to earthlings.com, <laughs> okay. or they can go to Amazon, you can get it on iTunes, you can get okay. it pretty much anywhere now. Well, did the film set out to do what you planned to have it do, or is Oh, that's it... such a great question, yeah. Or is it in, it's still work in progress? Yeah, work in probably. progress. I mean, you hope, you hope it has a positive effect. I always ask that question with films like this. Is it, uh, cause, you know, and people will tell you it's very film school. You know, don't teach, entertain. Even in docs, right. you know, like just keep it going, keep it moving. Right. And I always thought there's plenty of films about a number of subjects, documentaries particularly. You want to watch a film about being a roadie with the Rolling Stones, go ahead. How dinosaurs came into being, being a transvestite, whatever the case is, there's a million docs about it. Yep. That said, you know, tell me that in the canon of documentaries, there's at least one on the suffering of children or the elderly. Poverty, animals, the environment, you know, something that really just, you know, bears it wide open in the sun and just says, look at it. Um, so, so yeah, so it had a slow, it's what we call a movie having an afterlife. Right. Didn't, no one responded when it came out, but it, now, it, today, it still seems to be okay. Yeah. Well, um, are you, I, I, I assume you're a vegetarian or a vegan? Yeah, or, okay. of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, and how do you feel about, uh, I guess that, that lifestyle? Do you, do you? Because of, uh, I'm, I'm assuming because of the documentary and what you've seen, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I've been a vegetarian for a week now <laughs> since right. seeing the film. How's the transition? It's been okay. I, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't a heavy meat eater uh, right. beforehand. Well, so that makes it a little it, easier. It wasn't. Yeah. It's, uh, and I feel light. I don't know. Right. I've been sure. talking about, like, especially t yesterday I was doing stunts. I would do stunts. Right. And uh, I was doing stunts and stuff yesterday. I was like, wow, I just feel so light. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what that means, and but anyways. Um, well, you know what it means, of course, when you have a big, heavy breakfast, yeah, you, have big, you feel. <laughs> yeah, you have. And what's that. amazing about that? I'm no nutritionist. Right. I'll be clear about that. I'm not a nutritionist, but um, our brains tend to think that that means full. Right. We've we've become accustomed to that. Not just eating enough and still being sprightly and. But that sort of oh, I gotta sit down and yeah, just yeah, it's and just let, and let it yeah. yeah. So, where I haven't had that feel, you know, I'm, I'm I guess I'm grazing all day now, right? You know, constantly yeah. eating stuff. But um, but yeah, no, I, I feel great. Um, yeah. But I was wondering if, but for me, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I, I don't see. I guess the my conversion to a vegetarian diet is just because I I know where the. Uh, how the meat was prepared and how these animals yeah. were tortured yeah. in order to produce this. And right. I, I still feel that if, if I were, I guess, living on my own farm and raising my own meat, and, and one line that keeps always going through my head is uh, in Avatar, because mm -hmm. of this film I worked on, yeah. uh, when, when Zoe, uh, uh, Zoe asked, you know, she was telling Jake, you have to, you ask for the animal's permission. Right. Uh, Right, I for, remember for yeah. you know for to kill it and right. for to provide for. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of come from that mentality. Uh -huh. So um, I don't, I don't see it wrong eating animals. I just see it wrong treating them the way we treat yeah. them to yeah. to raise. So do you do you see it that way, or how do you see the the right. whole, you know? I understand. Yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. There there was a time for centuries where you know. I don't know, slaughterhouses go back quite far. If you read a Utopia, you know, you'll read about slaughterhouses in Utopia, and I believe that book goes back to the 1500s or so. I could be off by a century or so, but it's at least four or 500 years old. But mostly from the Industrial Revolution is when we began to see this massive sort of agricultural push for keeping the food close to, the, close to society instead of hunting, going out and seeking it all the time, mm -hmm. you know, keeping it close, containing it, and so on. Now. 100 years ago, if you go back to, let's say, 1912, it's 2012 now, so you go back to 1912, and you find a medical journal from 1912, and you read it, you won't find any, if you look at the top 10 causes of, of death, you won't find heart disease. Hmm. That's rather interesting. 
Right. Fast forward 100 years, and the number one cause of death is heart disease. Now, 100 years ago, meat was a sort of a special occasion right. kind of thing. Sunday, the Sunday roast, yeah. holidays. Maybe a little bit on the side with your rice and vegetables. It was sort of a, not a garnish, but not much, not a far cry from a garnish. It was right. expensive, and it was... Right. Today it's the opposite. It's bacon and eggs for breakfast, it's chicken sandwich for lunch, it's pizza for dinner. Yeah. So we've boosted it up, obviously. If one wants to live in tune with nature, kill their own animals, give a prayer, if you will, for the animal or for mm -hmm. nature, for providing it, that's one thing. Uh, I suppose that's the hunter mentality, right. really. Sure. You know, that this is what I go get my own food. And, right. But um, I'm. I'm sort of an advocate for no, no longer living by killing, like right. no longer living by killing, just it, moving beyond that. And uh, so I hope that answers the question. Sure. So and this kind of leads into my next question. Have you, I mean, with all of the uh, genetically modified stuff going on with, with not only the, uh, the fruits and vegetables and these things, which I won't go into right now because it's a whole other subject, sure. but I'm sure you've heard that there are experimenting with growing meat in labs, like yeah. slabs of yes, chicken right. breast or yeah. something like this. Right. <laughs> you know, is that, how, what's your take on that? <laughs> well, I, I call it frankenfood. Yes, frankenfood, you know, there you go. It's frankenfood, but then again, strawberries are frankenfood. When you go to Costco or somewhere and right. there's these strawberries, they're just like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of strawberries, you know. Right. That's because that strawberry is on steroids, you yeah. know, in nature, the strawberry does not grow right. that large genetically modified, as you said, in terms of a synthetic meat or mm -hmm. something that tastes like it, all they're trying to do is give people the sensation that they're accustomed to. Right. If that is a step away from actually killing a, li a living being, right. who's going a living being, that most people will feel is inferior. Yeah. You know, a chicken, a cow, and a pig is like, you know, it's not important. Yeah. Was... Which we talk about in the film that you're going to see tonight, which okay. we go to the next step about, you know, this perception, perception for this being as opposed to this being. Like we have to save the whales, right? But you know the chickens and the cows aren't really that important. That's the sort of duality right. to this, and does that not mirror itself in society? I, I I think it does. So, in terms of satisfying one's taste buds, you know, give them the fake meat stuff if if that helps in in the transition, getting off of it. But keep in mind too, don't forget this. This is I think a vital point. I hope I say it with enough impact, but. People don't really like meat. They think they do. They tell themselves they like meat. But no one's like eating raw flesh mm -hmm. off the bone with the hoof still hanging out of the mouth and the fur and the horns and the guts and the blood. Then no one's doing it. Yeah. Very few humans unless you're some weird tribe somewhere. They want all that stuff cut away. Yeah. And they want their meat, all the fat cut off and they want it rounded. And then they, it's full of sauces yeah. and seasons of the earth, I might add. Mm -hmm. Tastes of the earth are added back into it. So really what you're addicted to is the butter and the salt and the seasons and the flavorings. Hmm. And what you're chewing on, your base, happens to be this flesh. So whenever you get a carnivorous person saying, I have to eat meat, I love my meat, right. it's like, I defy this person not to have barbecue sauce and salt all, yeah. over, all over their meat. And generally there are exceptions to every rule, yeah. but that's what you're seeing. We're addicted to the flavorings of the meat. Meat's a base. So give them a synthetic if that's important. And if you want to do one better, try it. Just try it with tofu. Right. Try yeah. it with something else. I, I was going to say. It I, won't kill you. I, I, recently I went to this uh, vegetarian restaurant in Culver City. I forgot the, the name. Uh, but I had a, a portobello burger, right, or a tofu burger or something. And, I, and I've been telling everybody, this thing tastes better than any hamburger sure. I've ever had in my life. Why not? Yeah. Uh, and this is before I actually decided so to go. Well, Vegetarian, so that's progress. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I mean, and it has that. I guess the uh, the mushroom is that kind of fleshy, mm -hmm. um, gives you that base texture. Kind of thing, that's what yeah, is it needed. tastes. It's yeah. great. <laughs> I mean, look at your. I don't. I know. crave that. I don't know what I would if I was totally bare ass naked in the woods right. with my stubby fingers and my no fangs. Right, right. I don't know what I could catch by myself. Right. You know, I don't know how I would sort of tear into a deer <laughs> if I managed to catch a deer or a squirrel or something. I don't know how I'd open it. Um, yeah. Arguably, human beings are herbivores. Yeah. By our by our, our our makeup, you pick a piece of fruit off the tree and yeah. eat it. You know? 
or not. Yeah, yeah the thing, the thing, thing kind of. I don't know. That, yeah, that, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> and, and and then when you see people walking out of earthlings or seeing, not wanting to see any blood. Right. Yeah. Whereas the lion is just. God, yeah. I can't wait to go into it. Right. Let it sit there for a day. The vultures are picking at it and maggots are going, doesn't care, just, just goes right into yeah. the crotch and just starts chomping on guts. That's a carnivore. That yeah. is a carnivorous being. Yeah, I'll take you know? the apple any day. So that's just something to think about. To think about. Well, you, at the, just to wrap things up here, your next film, Unity, um, uh, so you, after getting Earthlings out there, uh, did you, and I'm assuming, um, I'm just guessing here, but maybe you can help fill it in, uh, you discovered some new things while making, did you discover new things while making Earthlings, and which uh, led you into this Unity, and, and what were those things, and yeah. if you could just give us, not without spoiling Unity for everybody, sure. but just give us a little hint right. on... Well, you know, the, the, the thing that began to nag, so you, I told you what nagged at me on Earthlings, I was just sort of suffering of beings and living by killing. And what nagged me, at me on unity was, was this idea of duality. Mm -hmm. was, the, was the fact that there would be empathy here for this, what we call expression of life. We say it a lot in the film, this term, expressions of life. These are expressions of life. And we see that nature is, we say this in the film, is multitudinous in her expression. So life is expressed as tigers and lions and mold and trees and snails and lambs and just all of these beings, life is, is, is multitudinous in her expression, in her expression. So why is it that this, is, this was the sort of genesis, if you will, of, of unity? Why is it we have empathy for this expression of life, mm -hmm. but have apathy for this expression of life? Why, what is that? What is that perception? Why is there a, a separation? And what I found most compelling was that 88% of the planet is religious in all combined religions. So as far as that goes, I, I would say that 88% of the planet is trying on some level to better themselves, mm -hmm. you know, live by a, a certain code of conduct, if you will, that's right. spiritual or something better. So 88%, that's quite high. Yeah. And then you have um, all these self-help books. Yeah. And we have wonderful 12-step programs. Yeah. I mean, we have great stuff. We have philosophies that are just, I mean, go to your bookstore, library, it's yeah. just incredible. And technology and all this wisdom. And despite all that, all that, there's still empathy here, apathy there. Right. And that was, that was the base of unity. I thought that this is completely inconsistent. This is completely inconsistent. Right. When, will, what, when will human beings realize this duality? that we are dualistic, and how does it not mirror itself? So the whole film is this study in duality. And unfortunately, um, to illustrate that, it's juxtaposed with a tremendous amount of disunity, sure, disconnection. Yeah. The words are very positive, the words are about unity, but the images are about disunity. Right. And I think that works on viewers. But you'll find, as you'll see you know, tonight or when others see it, that it, it's almost as if whatever taboos are, are built into us in society, coming mm -hmm. up through society, or that we've built into ourselves, when your consciousness begins to expand, it begins to butt up against your, your whatever taboos you have built in, and, right. then, and this is considered agonizing. This is like a problem. You know, like when you first become a vegetarian, that yeah. was a good, and you're like, wow, well, wait a minute, and it's your whole frame of reference, and maybe right. your family's gonna give you a hard time, sure. or your friends. It's extraordinary, what do they care right. what you eat? It shouldn't matter at all, right, right. but they do, they do yeah. care about it. So, but you're like, well, I saw this thing, in there. or you read a book, or whatever the case may be, right. and I don't wanna do it anymore. I don't wanna, you know. That's an ethical choice. Some people do it for health reasons, mm -hmm. which, is, which is fine too. So this is kind of what happens. You, you know, you look at this stuff, and uh, it pushes you a little mm -hmm. bit. Absolutely. Yeah. So well, that's really what you well, need to know. Uh, I guess just to wrap things up, and I and I don't remember the quote exactly. Maybe you can help me. There's a line in Earthlings. Uh, it, it talks about that we can't. We, wars will keep going on if we don't. If we don't. Uh, oh, Tolstoy. Tolstoy has a quote. I yeah. think that's the one. Okay. Yeah. As long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. Yeah, that was because that was he's saying as long as and we say we, we take this further in unity that's why I think it's a sequel right I consider it a sequel mm -hmm. um, as long as some group of being some expression of life is considered inferior it will mirror itself I think it'll mirror itself in humanity I think it will because 
Because the perception's internal. So if you think, I just don't, you know, like I have to save the harp seals, all the harp seals, we can't be killing harp seals anymore, but you just don't care about pigs. If, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. So right. if that exists, then it's going to be, it's going to show up somewhere else. So until we're really willing to look at ourselves and go, why am I being inconsistent with this? Right. Why do I have preferential attachment here, but I'm totally indifferent there? Right. And then I'm going to church, I'm doing yoga, and I'm <laughs> home, and I'm looking for peace on yeah. earth, and we uh, want it. That's, that's the question. That's it. I think that is, that wraps up. The, I hope uh, I didn't drone on too long. No, no, this is great. This is great. But uh, I'm going I'm to end it there because cool. I think that's where people need to, Perfect. to, to let it sink Excellent. in. Um, everybody, this is Conversations That Matter. Sean Monson, Thank you for thanks for coming me. down. Thank Looking forward much. to seeing Unity. Uh,